don't have your badge. There's a little bit of static, so if you are on the phone, please mute your microphones. Was that number 11? Yes. I got a new one. <laughs> this <your order? laughs> you got a new one? Well, this is all option on. You want a permanent? Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> the one's broken loose in Congress. <laughs> all right, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, first of all, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, I tried very desperately not to be back with me on camera, so I'm going to stand a little bit back. Um, so as you know, today we're having a workshop to talk about potential planning requirement rules. So a lot of this agenda was based on your feedback. So first off, we just want to say thank you so much for now and in the future. Your time and energy, these thoughtful comments that help us structure the agendas for these meetings is extremely useful to kind of figure out what bite size we need to get going on um, as we kind of wade through what can be a pretty uh, amorphous process at times. So thank you for that. Um, just a quick round of introductions, even though I feel like at this point we all know each other pretty well, but um, my name is Sarah Gorkel. I work at the State Energy Office um, and distribute energy resources. Glenn, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Glenn Blackman. Washington State Department of Commerce. Thank you all for coming. And we also have Brittany Wagner, who is helping us on as audio DJ today. So thank you for your time as well. Um, so how this is going to work today, it's going to be very similar to the conversation we had at Wenatchee, if folks are there or listening to that. So we have, if you look at your agendas, um, we have this separated into kind of three chunks today um, with different kinds of conversations. So um, we'll kind of do a big chunk to start with on the discussion of procedural requirements. So these things up here, um, and we'll get into some more details about teeing up that discussion, take a short break, um, and then have some more things after the break. Um, as before, this is not meant to be an exhaustive conversation. We have obviously a lot of lots to cover, and folks bring different interests to the table. So the invitation today is bring your ideas to the table, bring up things you think can um, really need a discussion, um, because there is a lot to discuss in this. Um, and you know, the follow-up will be in public comments um, further down the road. Glenn, I'm looking at you on that for confirmation. Yes, I see a silent nod from Glenn. So we will follow up this meeting with some more kind of directed comments as Glenn has been providing um, to kind of help us figure out what we need to be answering right now. Okay, so before I get started, is there any um, kind of clarifying questions about what we're doing today? The agenda. Not specifics, just about the kind of overarching. Okay. Should we do introductions in the room? I'd like that. Great. Um, so we are being recorded, so there's a bunch of folks on the line. So if you could just quickly uh, say your name and where you're from. We'll just go zip around the room. Cliff, we'll start with you. I'm Cliff Sears with uh, Grand Beauty. Seaman with Chelan Beauty. Dave Arbaugh here on behalf of Chelan Beauty. John Collins, Director of the Energy Project. Uh, Kelly Hall from Climate Solutions. Lisa Rennie, Tacoma Power. Rachel Clark, Tacoma Power. Chris Lever, Tacoma Power. Tom Haymaker, Clark PD. Matt Abbott, Clark PD. Uh, Tashiana Wangler, Public Generating. John Rothland, Avista. Annette Pearson, CLC Light. Brittany Wagner, Department of Commerce. Doug Howell, Sierra Club. Charlie Black, Consultant for Invenergy. Tony Bash, Northwest Energy Coalition. Eleanor Bastion, Washington Environmental Council. Eric Gruen, Public Center. Clark Lee Isaac, Snohomish PUD. Ian Hunter, Snohomish PUD. Nicholas Garcia, Okuda. Tyler King, Clown County. Kevin White, Benton PUD. Liz Klump, Bonneville Power. Tom Bernard, State Auditor's Office. 
Matt Domit, uh, representing Lewis and Callis PUDs and PPUs. Uh, Jeff Miller, electric by transportation construction. Harry Durbin, Puget Sound Energy. And Philip Popoff, Puget Sound Energy. Great. Thank you so much. And I probably imagine there's too many on the phone to kind of do a non clunky introduction. So we'll just continue on from there. Um, okay, so why don't we go ahead and just jump on into the first topic. So uh, to start, we have a discussion of procedural requirements uh, for the clean energy implementation plan. And so the question really here, and I've written them up here, it might be a little bit difficult to see. I'll be taking notes throughout um, as well. Um, but the question really is, you know, what's the process the utilities will be following when they prepare a clean energy implementation plan? And is there anything that needs a rule or specification above and beyond what's already in the statute? So several people have, you know, pointed to some things that might need clarification or really don't need clarification. So either of those insights would be would be great to kind of flesh out. So. Um, yeah, I don't know if we want to go ahead and have someone kick us off, or if Glenn, you want to add anything to the framework for this conversation. Well, just a little bit of background on this. Um, you, you know, the, when we discussed this at the earlier workshop and uh, on the written comments, um, we kind of threw everything out there at once, you know, section six, section 14. And um, it also seemed like People jumped in on kind of some substantive requirements, either don't do that or do do that. Um, and in going back and looking over the material that we've produced so far, struck me that uh, we ought to spend a little bit of time just uh, on some stuff that, you know, maybe is kind of a little bit, you know, not the most interesting topic overall, but kind of that basic procedural stuff around um, what is it exactly that uh, goes into clean energy plan, clean energy implementation plan. And uh, talk about that a little bit without mixing in the integrated resource plan part, even though the two are definitely related. It seemed like it'd be good to spend a little bit of time on some of the more procedural or mechanical aspects of the clean energy implementation plan. <clears throat> and I do uh, feel like we're all going to come into this uh, with, we're going to bring our, our IRP experiences with us uh, into this. So even though this is not an IRP, uh, the IRP either is model that we would have in mind procedurally for the CEIP, or we may say, no, that's not a good model and don't get those two mixed up. You know, you're welcome to take that, that uh, idea either way, but I just, you know, observe that I think the, uh, the IRP is going to, our experience with that is going to inform the way we think about the CEIP. So we just wanted to go over the um, kind of the basics in there. One thing that I was struck by thinking kind of going back and looking at section six a little bit is not a lot in there actually about you know specific things that need to be done or whatever. It it may be that um, really all the meat is in the, the IRP discussion, which we'll get to a little bit later on the agenda. Uh, but then again maybe there is you know, I'd like to do that is just talk specifically about the CEIP and how you envision that uh, being developed, edited through your internal processes, uh, reviewed in your public processes, submitted here, reviewed by the state auditor, things like that. Uh, so that's kind of what I'm hoping to get out of this first. Uh, section of the, the meeting today. And I'm just going to adjust Chris's collar a little bit. <laughs> okay. So any clarifying questions about that? Is that, is that kind of ask makes sense for what we're trying to dig into here? 
guess we'll just open it up if anybody has anything. Um, so these were some of the those procedural requirements that Glenn sort of plucked out and that has kind of just talked through. Um, you know, there's specifics around any of the questions we have on this or you know what the process would be, what might you be handed upon. Yeah, please I'll, go ahead. I'll kick us off. Great, thank um, you. I'm noticing the fifth bullet on there is auditor review. Yes. And I'm wondering what the scope of the review would be and whether that's mandated by statute. Do you want to say anything about that? Um, I guess I'd rather let that float around a little bit and see what other people think about it. I would just add, second that question. Uh -huh. We also were looking through the statutes and didn't find any auditor review of the mining requirements in the statute. So we're wondering where this came from. And what, what did you find in the statute from the way of the responsibilities of the auditor and the CTAC? I can't answer that question because I was looking to answer a specific question, not a general question. I, I, there, I'm sure that there's, I'm open to the possibility that there's specific requirements for the auditor in the statute. I just don't know. I didn't, I didn't look for that question. Okay. Can anyone else said any thinking about, you know, where these, um, the review might come in? And maybe if there's cuties in the room that wanted to, Share anything about that or how they thought about this process at all? The state auditors review? Yeah. Okay. Where that might live or how one might think about that in terms of this process. <clears throat> I was wondering if we could just start with um, maybe a general understanding of where we currently see the role of the auditor, and I guess I'm most familiar with the auditor's role in terms of, of compliance with I-937. Um, asking other people if, if there are other areas that I'm not aware of. Since I'm the <laughs> office, yeah. office, I guess I pulled my cue to speak. Like, oh, <laughs> no, as, as, I've been, as I've been reading this over and over again, uh, much like the EIA, it does have a clause in there. It says the auditor shall be responsible for auditing uh, utility compliance with this act or with this chapter. So, meaning chapter 19405, everything therein uh, is subject, potentially subject to audit. So, the questions I've been asking, you know, trying to listening for and trying to get a read on is how people are doing certain things, how we might look at those things, the plan being one of uh, let me give you a little background. I won't take a lot of time, but with under the EIA, you have a target, a conservation target. You go through a process, the CPA process that supports that target. And we go in and look at the construct of that target to make sure that the, the WAC rules have been followed in its construct. And that the in doing that, you've complied with the act. So coming is interim work. We'll look at the construct of the, uh, the target, take a break, let the the period go by, the acquisitions happen, they get logged, then we look at the acquisitions relative to target and say, did you meet your target? And then we finish the engagement every two weeks. So a plan would be, you know, due on January 1st, 2022, and presumably would be constructed, you know, in accordance with the act, uh, the CETA. And we would look at how that was constructed in accordance with what's written under RCW and the WAC rules, much like we do the conservation targets for EIA. Take a pause, come back after the four-year period and see if the plan was complied with. I asked that more as a question or, you know, for uh, open to other discussion. I, I haven't landed in a solid place with what this means for us. And um, so that's kind of my vision, preliminary vision, moving forward from this spot. Yeah, I mean, this is Kelly from Climate Solutions. I think I've been thinking about it in a, in a very similar way. There are a number of uh, items that are required in the Clean Energy Implementation Plan that do require kind of a compliance check. Um, and so I have been thinking about that as kind of a, 
review, making sure that um, that plan actually is in compliance with the law and that the items that are uh, the targets identified do like that, um, that the auditor has. Um, has My big question is about this particular area of the plan. You know, there's a couple of elements that are in, in it, uh, suing all uh, energy conservation, demand response, and uh, what's the other? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, renewables. And, uh, you know, just getting an idea, I know, you know, how the, the qualifying utilities under the EIA are approaching it's the same thing, you know, so there's no change there in how we would look at a conservation target. Um, but how would a smaller utility, uh, electrical utility, find it, or demonstrate a pursuit all without going through an exhaustive process like a CPA? You know, it, it doesn't seem like a small utility of maybe five or eight people would be able to take that on. I don't know. It was just, you know, one of the questions is how do smaller ones, how are they to adapt to this? And what are they do? What's the process they're going through? will dictate how we look at it and, and how we pursue ensuring that compliance was met in the development of the plan. Yes, sir. Yeah, Clar clarification, Sean Seamus, Slim PD. So the intent though is to look at the plan or the auditor after the fact there's not an approval process of the plan. It's just after you've gone through your year, you've got a plan like you would <laughs> other uh, Enforce or clarification or review, it's after the fact as opposed to a pre approval. Yeah. One of the things yeah, I was thinking about was yeah, it goes through the, the utilities board commissioner and it's approved at that point, and that's right. where we take it and look at it and say, Yeah, it was constructed in accordance with the act as interim work to the, the main finale, you know, at the end of the period, saying, Did you comply with it? Laid out. Right. So, and so, as a follow-up question, that is done through the normal audit chain process with our normal business, or is this going to have its own? It doesn't have its own process. The DIA it's a little its different. Own. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that point yet internally. So, we're those are discussions. This is informing the discussion right. we have later down the road how we roll this out, whether it's local teams coming out and doing the work, whether it's specialized work done by a hired uh, consultant that we hire, or specialized group of us. Uh, people within our office that are able to do that. We don't know yet. I have a follow-up so, question, um, please. Um, so when I look at section six, and I'm not sure how it was actually codified into what section, I think you were referencing what RCW 19. 405. 405. Yeah. So is that where, I mean, that, that's what I'm just asking. Section six, I don't believe references an audit, but I think if I'm following your, your logic, it does end up in 19405. I, I was looking for it before I opened my mouth and I couldn't locate it. <laughs> right. So, uh, can I get back to you on that? Yes, that'd okay. be great. Thank you. So, I, I did want someone to respond to something you said. Um, you said with regard to the number of units, your vision for the with regard to the your vision of mimicking what's going on in the Energy Independence Act with regard to this act. And clearly, in the Energy Independence Act, it, it describes that failure to meet the targets that you identify results in a consequence. There's no similar language here. And we would generally believe that a plan is means it's a document that helps the utility think about how it's going to move forward in the future, but it is not a commitment to do any particular item or take any particular action. So, yes, you have to propose interim targets and you have to propose targets for energy efficiency, demand response, and renewable energy. But if you have proposed those targets and four years later, for whatever reason, you did not achieve those targets, we would assert that there's no consequence to that. Moreover, a target can be zero. So, for example, one of the things we've said multiple times with regard to demand response is that if you're not a utility that is its own BA, its own balancing authority, you won't have the information unless there's a, a mechanism set up between you and the BA to know when to uh, instigate a demand response event, either an increase or a decrease. And 
if you don't have that information, demand response in your instance provides no benefit. It's just the cost. And I can see a utility saying, in our situation, that our target is zero. And that would be a legitimate uh, target based upon that utility's specific circumstances. Yeah, oh, I, I, I think I'm re seeing the reference to the auditor's office in section nine of the bill. Um, I don't know, page that 26, sub, sub 10. And, um, and I guess the way that I had been reading that section was it was related to compliance with the standards. Um, you know, the greenhouse gas neutral standards, the, you know, I don't know, maybe the no coal standards, um, the, uh, the 2045 standard. Um, I, I hadn't thought of it as applying to the Clean Energy Action Plan or implementation plans. Um, so I guess that would be a question I have is, is that, you know, because it's in a section that I think has to do with compliance with actual standards, and not necessarily, you know, submission of, of the CEIPs. Does that, does that mean it applies to the CEIPs? I, I don't know. Well, did you have something? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess I was trying to build those uh, at the same time. I guess the way I read it is that it is daughter's responsible for auditing compliance with the chapter. And so it is not just the, the two standards, but um, the entire chapter, which incorporates a lot more than just the 2030 standard and the 2045 standard. So I'm certainly interpreting that a little bit more broadly, I think. Um, and then you may be, and then Nicholas, I guess I would just push back a little bit on that. This is just a, I mean, there is language in here that uh, indicates that you have to be demonstrating pro progress and identifying specific actions to be taken. And so I think that it's, um, you know, the IRP is a little bit more of, of a plan and the Clean Energy Implementation Plans, I think, are because they are implementation plans, they're, they're a little more action oriented than um, just a plan. I, I agree with you that in your plan, something could be zero. Uh, that that is possible, but that you're still needing to be held accountable to what you're laying out in, in the action plan. Technically, this is the implementation plan. Well, I would just push back on that. If you look at the IRP, there is both a long-term plan and an action plan, two-year action plan. And to me, that's similar sort of language, and yet the action plan has no penalty consequence for not meeting the, the, the plan two years after you develop it. Just, it seems to me that as long as you've met the requirements of the planning, you know, which is clear, you know, it's fairly extensive, so I'm not saying it's going to be easy, but as long as you've met the requirements of the planning, it provides a guidance for you to be how to move forward. Six months on, a year on, you may say, hey, look, at things are different. We have a new load that we're going to have to deal with, or we lost a load, or we're going to, you know, there's things, other things that are happening that we didn't anticipate in our plan. And to say that, okay, <clears throat> you have to ignore all that and just implement the plan as you developed it seems to me to be inconsistent with other notions in the, in the act. So you should implement it in ways that minimize costs, for example. Can I give, do you want to respond to that? And then Johnny, you can pop in. Yeah, just, I mean, I uh, I think we agree in some places and disagree in others, but that I, I agree that your plan doesn't have to be implemented exactly as you have laid it out. Things change, technologies change, things change, but I do think that some form of accountability is is important. And so um, an explanation of why things changed and why your plan didn't go according to plan. Um, I, I think we have a the mechanism looks like, and I'm not necessarily saying that it's, it's a penalty, but some form of, of accountability. I think, I think this differs from IRPs in a couple of key ways. And one of them is that um, up until now, the IRPs get acknowledged for the IOUs by the UTC. There's not an approval per se. They get acknowledged that they've been done. Now the CEIP has to be approved. And we were talking in section nine, for example, uh, there are some various, um, there's some sideboards there about when you can't meet the responsibilities of your plan. 
And at that point, you even have to come back with a plan that says we've fallen behind for whatever reason or we can't do it for whatever reason. But here's how we plan to meet our standards. And there's real strong language in there that says, even though we haven't met our plan right now or we're behind or we're not going to meet the standards, we still have to find a way to do it. And that's in section nine. So I wouldn't just hang around in section six. I would look at section nine. And that's 910 where the audit requires, I think, that language. Yeah, 090. Yeah. Uh, 19405. 090. Right. Subsection 10 is the audit. So I wouldn't assume that there isn't something because then there's penalties involved too. I have a question about um, something you said about the implementation plan being approved. And I'm seeing that it needs to be adopted by the governing body. Of the I, was, I was I was talking about the IOUs having oh, acknowledgement for the I, agency. Oh okay. Yeah, I mean, just I was showing the parallel. And the CEIPs are going to have to be approved by the UTC for the IOUs. There's, which is a step more than they've done now. Right now, their IRPs and their action plans are not. Those CIEPs have to be approved by the UTC. But there's no clear direction in the law for them to be approved by anyone exactly for CLUs, right? Well, the governing, governing board, board. The governing yeah. and yeah. then there's yeah. then there's the audit, and then if you fall behind on that in section nine, the way I was reading that, you can the board can also uh, issue a waiver, but you still have to come back with um, <coughs> um, showing how you're going to comply eventually. I'm trying to shorten. I can't find it right off, but that's it's not like I think. It's not like it's, oh, we just didn't meet the plan. There's right. got to be real commitment and intention to meet those standards. I'm just going to just pause a sec. Actually, I'm going to let Tom respond, and then we have a question on the phone. Well, we just, she, she just wanted everyone to say their names first before he spoke because oh, they can't tell who's talking. I'm sorry, that was much appreciated. Yeah. So, Tom, go ahead. Tom Bernard, uh, the, again, for those who missed it, RCW 19405090. Subsection nine is for the investor owned utilities. Subsection 10 is for the consumer owned utilities and the auditor's role. So, did I get that right? Oh, yes. I know, nine and 10. Okay. Yeah, Lisa, Lisa Randy with Tacoma Power. I still, though, don't see in section nine, I do see the role of the auditor, but section nine is about compliance with the standard. I don't see the implementation plan or the action plan addressed at all. Um, so it would seem to me that yes, there is a role for the auditor and actually for a utility to meet the standards. Um, but I'm not, there are other actions and planning. Seems like that's a stretch that that would be audited. So Lisa, Tom yeah. Bernard again. A subsection 10 says the auditor is responsible for auditing compliance with this chapter and rules adopted under this chapter that apply to those utilities, the consumer owned utilities. And the attorney general is responsible for enforcing compliance. So when we're reading compliance with this chapter and the rules adopted by this chapter, I'm thinking of 19405 as a whole. Okay. I mean, that's the problem with looking at the statute and not looking at the, in, the yeah, codified I, I, version. I, I, it's a little hard to, to, to meet what chapter. Um, <laughs> and so, insofar as it goes into the requirements of an IRP, that's under the new chapter. I didn't consider us as being uh, responsible for auditing compliance with the IRP laws. That's some, a chapter separate from what this is saying. So that, that's, where I, that's where my brain kind of draws the line. So right or wrong, that's that's kind of what I'm thinking. Thank you. Oh yeah, please go ahead. Ian Hunter, Snowish PD. Um, I agree that the the state auditor's language in uh, 09010 gives the auditor purview over the full chapter. Um, but when I look at 060, the the compliance standard seems to be just developing the plan itself, as Nicholas was pointing out. And while you do establish targets. Um, the substantive standard, the accountability that Kelly was referring to would be the 040 and 050, what you're planning for, what you're planning to meet, what the plan is intended to be getting you from point A to point B. And so having a separate audit of your plan and did you comply with your plan exactly doesn't seem to make sense when you have the ultimate assessment, which is 040 and 050 in the future. 
Can I ask, this is Johnny, can I ask a question of you? So when you're looking at section six, um, let's see, the one is the IOUs and two, six, two A, it says by January 2nd, or January 1, 2022, and every four years thereafter, each consumer owned utility must develop and submit to the department the four-year clean energy implementation plan that supports four, one, and four, five. You don't think the auditor would be looking at that? I think the auditor would look at that, but the compliance standard is you develop it, you submit it to the department, and it includes these things, one, two, three, and four subsections. It wouldn't be an after the fact audit of, you know, when you developed your, when you made the specific actions over the next four years in subsection four, did you do every one of those things that you said? Because as we develop our plan, we may find that, you know, what we said in year one doesn't make sense in year three or year four. So we may take a different path to get to our ultimate compliance goal uh, in 04 and 050, but being judged along the way doesn't make sense because there may be. But then in your next things. compliance plan, you may be acknowledging what you planned didn't work and here's what you're planning for the next wave. Right. It's it's kind of a constant update as you go to say, you know, this is what we planned on last time. That didn't make sense. So now that we're filing our new plan, this is our new plan for how we're going to meet those standards. And this is Lisa from Tacoma. I think demand response is a perfect example of how that would play out given that like energy efficiency or energy conservation, you need the customer's participation. So the utility might say we this is our this is our target, but we could, just like we have found ourselves in under energy efficiency targets, not being able to perhaps get to that goal because we can't force the customer to participate. So that's an example of how we're thinking about. So I am hearing that there is not a clear understanding amongst everyone at the table as to this kind of adoption by the governing board uh, or, you know, through the COU process for this EIP. But there's some ideas that sound in the same ballpark, but, you know, a, a process from the compliance standards, submit to commerce, have SAO approval, you know, and this one through four sections, as Ian says, but then, you know, there are a look back, as Tom has kind of said, maybe that could be a way to do it, or is it the next plan is sort of there's some kind of look back in the next plan and then that's what you're looking at and that's what then gets approved so i guess the question is really a tactical one around what needs if anything clarification around this process or if there's an understanding in the room which is i think what we're trying to get to here tom. yeah tom bernard i just uh, wanted to make sure that the auditor was separate from any kind of adoption or any kind of regulatory role as far as these plans go or how they're rolled out. That we're looking at the plan for the elements that it's required to have. And at the top, I said, and do we then come back and look at if it was with, whether it was complied with or not? I'm not sure. It didn't, the, the act doesn't seem to lead me to that conclusion directly. So that's more of a question for the room to kick around. I'm not sure. So in what Ian described, is there anyone that sees it slightly differently or would want, you know, there's more steps, there's less steps, just kind of curious to bounce up what you kind of laid out as a springboard. Comment from the phone? Oh, yes. Hi. Hi, uh, this is Garrison from Snohomish. And, you know, when we think about uh, the cadence of these planning uh, documents and look back, uh, you know, potential from an auditing standpoint. One real conflict that comes to mind is the biennial conservation target setting and the four-year clean energy implementation plan. So if we were to set, you know, a year four target for conservation, we would expect that our biennial, biennial conservation target for that same year would have been updated in year three. And, you know, there's lots of scenarios uh, where that conservation uh, target could change and we would be then audited on the biennial target for year four from the second biennial conservation target setting and the clean energy implementation plan target if it were to be a look back provision and you know be a lot of, uh, kind of administrative headaches there I'm not sure I'm seeing that in the language as, as being justified either. And so I think we'll have a chance to kind of maybe dig in a little bit more about that and after the break, Glenn, or did you want to jump in a little bit more now? Uh, I think uh, <clears throat> we can hold uh, a specific question about um, uh, interrelationship between the CEIP and the uh, uh, EIA target setting for the next session. Uh, you know, the, 
the next piece on the agenda. Um, but I do, I think it's, it's been useful to uh, this discussion to separate out uh, the question about the submission of a plan that complies with the rules versus any kind of check about uh, you know, did you do the things that you think you should do in your plan. That does seem to me like a, a, an important distinction to make. Yes. Kelly? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that, and I think the, the latter is where we're having um, more disagreement. I, I, I just want to go back to what I said before, that I, I don't think necessarily each utility has to comply with exactly what their plan said, but developing some form of accountability, I, I think where the auditor would come in is what form of accountability, what does that process look like in the commerce rules, and what that process looks like, whatever it may be, then the auditor comes back and, and determines whether or not a utility has complied with, with that. Um, so that you do still have to demonstrate compliance with the targets. It, it might be an explanation of why things have changed, but um, some sort of process for why you did or did not. So what I'm hearing there is um, around this auditor review question that there sh that commerce should pass rules that would explain what that process is outside of the language and statute. I think yes, I think maybe a step further, laying out a process for how utilities would demonstrate compliance with all these different sets of targets that they had developed in the, the implementation plan. This is Nicholas Garcia of Mokuda. Yes, we just don't see what the statute contemplates that sort of review. <clears throat> and <clears throat> so we're, we're, we're struggling to, to, to say, how you would go from a requirement to do just what Glenn said, you do a plan, it includes all these elements, to saying there is some sort of a review slash after the fact penalty process or consequence process that's included, because we just don't see it in the language of the statute. So we would argue that that's a not consistent with the policies that are part of the statute. I was just going to add real quick. You know, in, in the work that the state auditor's office does, the EIA is very unique to anything else we do in that there are monetary penalties for non-compliance. I can't think of anything else that we audit that has that kind of weight and gravity. That being said, there are areas that we look at that have no have no monetary impact. It's whether you comply or not, and our report just says yes, you did or no, you did, and we're done. Well, that's and I'm seeing these areas where there are no monetary penalties or consequences being just that. We verified that the utility complied in developing its plan, period, or it did not and it missed these elements. I don't know where else we'd go with this based on what's written. So that's just off the top of my head. I, I'm not sold on that being the solution, but it's a possibility. That Okay. I see a question oh, real quick. I see, yeah, Derek. I was just going to add. I mean, I think it does, is clear from the, the legislature that there was a purpose to these plans, and they're not just there for the you know making up plans, but they were to get towards targets. Uh, so I think there is some basis for affirming that that those plans need to be reasonable and actually um, uh, getting to that goal. So what that process is, it's a little bit less of a after the fact looking back to making sure that that plans are actually being done in a way that's uh, achieving the legislator's intent. Um, so that piece, I think, think, seems critical. The accountability mechanism for that. Um, so in terms of that achieving the legislative intent, intent, Tom, how do you think about that in your role? I think about that as being, uh, is there clear uh, criteria that we can point to that say uh, we're auditing some uh, a plan and it fell short on a particular compliance area that I could point to that and said you you did X it should have been Y based on this criteria and the question in my head is what criteria are we reaching for? Mm -hmm. you know what would we cite as the correct way of doing something if we were to conclude something was incorrect and we need something we couldn't just come in and just yeah and I definitely don't want to cut off because that's no, a really important conversation about sort of what the criteria is. 
And that's, we have put some aside some time at the very end of today, kind of dig into that more. Um, we've listed a couple things here, but if there's other- Let's just uh, pull a bullet for their update. Hi, if you're online, can you mute? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, go ahead. I didn't yeah. think so either. And then um, probably a comment. The, the I CPI yourself, Charlie. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm Charlie Black. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> been doing IRP for over 30 years uh, for all kinds of organizations. Um, and so my question is, is there general agreement that the CEIPs uh, the results of the CI, CEIPs uh, define quantifiable progress toward meeting compliance by 2030 and by 2045? Pause there. Is, is that? Do the CE, does a CEIP imply or, or define quantifiable progress toward compliance? Plans did you also, you said you had a statement too, or do we want to open that up? Well, it, no, kind of the statement would be contingent on that because I, okay. I'm not <laughs> as deeply steeped as in this as some people are, especially the legislative history. This is Johnny Bosch. The CEIPs are supposed to have specific and interim targets on them. They're helping you get to the standards for four and five. So the the interim targets would be, you know, kind of the, you're supposed to get to 100 percent which way along and 100 percent are you mm -hmm. specific targets around energy efficiency, DRs, and renewable energy. How many megawatts are you going to be building? Right? So do you plan to do it? Right? And like Lisa's right, you might not make it at the end, but there are your quantifiable targets and you should be able to justify your next plan, what happened? You know, I think that's one of my concerns is that, you know, you just want to throw those out and then go, oops. Yeah. Well, I, I can share stories about how actual actions have dramatically diverged from plans. Uh, for example, IRPs being done as an IRP, and then the acquisition people not, totally ignoring the IRP and doing mark to market at utilities here, um, rather than an integrated portfolio analysis. So there's a tension here. Obviously, actual actions may and probably should diverge. For certain reasons in implementation, but that doesn't mean that there's no accountability for um, making good efforts to actually implement the plan. So there, there's a natural tension here that has to be balanced. But I think one way in the rules that might help on the front end of this is for the rules to at least encourage setting specific uh, targets to quantify progress toward compliance with the overall goals. Um, and then I guess I can answer the second part of this. It's, it's what do you do after implementation has occurred? And just from a practitioner's point of view of resource planning and acquisition, it seems to make really good practical sense to me in each successive plan to do a look back. And again, the rules could either encourage that or require that, but that gets into the legal question of what the law actually states, so whatever that's worth. So this is Lisa Johnny. When you mentioned the targets, were you talking about the interim targets for demand response and energy efficiency? Right. Those are the specific targets. Yeah, that are established, and that's the part that's approved by a board for a consumer. Right. 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 That's part of the CEIP. Right. The specific targets and their targets have to be part of the CEIP that your board would approve. Right. Um, actually, you want to tell you um, yeah. Tom Hemick with Clark. But, I mean, it's interesting that you, you mentioned our boards. I mean, they are the ones who are going to uh, see to it that, that we are meeting the obligations of the utility. And you know, it's our job to bring to them what those, what those obligations are. Uh, and, and so, from a tension balance perspective that, that Charlie's talking about, I think that's where that should happen. And, and I think that each utility has a, a different perspective on, on what their um, progress is gonna be 
getting from the 2020 to 2030. And for <laughs> folks to come in and say, oh no, you got to straight line it from here to here, or you got to establish um, for, you know, particular benchmarks. I just, I just think that's a little bit of an overreach. And I think that's not uh, what well, was the intention? I think the intention was, yeah, you guys got to think about it, which we will. You guys need to make sure you hit the targets at 2030, which we will. And whatever you need to do in between to position yourselves, you got to have a plan for that. And that's all pretty common sense. And if, and if we weren't doing that, our boards would uh, probably find others who would. And so that, to me, um, I just I don't want us to lose sight that we all do have governing boards that have an obligation for us to meet what the uh, what the requirements of this of this act. Um, this is Johnny back again. I was going to say we totally recognize when we were working this out that every utility would have its own path to meeting those standards. I think what if I can put words in on Charlie that it's that you just can't throw something down and say that's our path. <laughs> that's and I agree with that. It's being consistent and committed to your path. It's all an looking iterative at. process that we're going yeah. to go through yeah, yeah. from here no, to there. Your, regulatory board has to be just nervous about having folks coming in and saying, oh, no, you, you get So, Tom, and then Kelly, I'll get a little close there. Go ahead, Tom. So, Tom, Tom Bernard, Tom, in response to your comment, that's the way I've seen the world all along, is that we're coming in and looking at a plan that's been adopted by a board that says this is what and that's that sets the criteria right there as far as that plan is concerned. So just making sure that plan has followed the path that it's supposed to and arriving to where it did. Sure. You know, that's that's so I agree with your vision. Okay. And Kelly and then Nicholas. Yeah, I was I'm going way back to what Charlie said around this quantifiable uh, progress and just going back to the language, it does say specific actions that demonstrate progress towards meeting the standards. So not just the standards themselves, but what does that progress look like? The legislature did not quantify what that progress looked like, but it's certainly non zero. So there's a very broad quantification, but uh, still, that there is does need to be some sort of demonstration of. Nicholas? Well, I'm just going to respond to a slight part, but I don't agree with your assessment just generally. But what, with regard to what Charlie said, I want to be really clear in that I don't disagree that an after the fact assessment by a utility of why or why it did not decide to actually implement the actions in this plan is a good idea. I think it is, but it's the question in my mind is not whether a utility should undertake that on its own initiative, but rather is that required in the statute? And I would argue it is not. It doesn't, the statute doesn't say that. So whether or not it's a good idea, and I, I can concur, it is a good idea. It's but that doesn't mean something that there's authority granted in the statute for commerce to set a requirement for in. Okay. Um, Doug Howell, um, Tom, I, I wanted to um, um, uh, uh, ask a question, put a question on the table. As I, I agree that you know the the. Publics do have their oversight board that are going to ensure that you're on track um, to the 2030 benchmark is what a lot of the lens is going to be first to CIPs, CEIPs that are being put together. But I also think there was a very clear intent around the reason we have a four year CEIP and it's supposed to start in 2022 is to ensure that what happens too often with compliance is that we'll 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 um, might have ten years to comply, but we'll really make the effort in the last two or three years, and uh, often we'll we'll see compliance happen that way. And that's why I think there was a very clear intent to not like you say it's clearly it's not necessarily a straight line. Some things like acquisition are at least going to be lumpy, but there very clearly was an intent that we're not going to allow like a last minute try to race to comply. There is an intent that you're front loading work to be done to make sure that we're on that path in the early years and not putting that off. I, I guess my point is that may not be a number. That may be activity that we're taking to get there where we see ourselves 
as making progress towards getting to 2030, but it doesn't necessarily mean we changed our um, carbon footprint between 2030. It's Can you just give an example. Um, for instance, you know, resource acquisition. I mean, if we look at that and say, you know, in 2026, we're going to go out and, and get resources that take three years to build in order to meet the obligation in 2030. We're not going to take other actions uh, in the interim to increase our or decrease our carbon footprint because we're making progress towards 2030. And, and that's a that's a good example. That's, and so let me add to add some color to that. So in 2022, we would we would hope to the best of your ability, you would already be forecasting that in 2022. We'll be forecasting where we're going to be in 2030. And, and so that may include in 2022 that you would you would see an acquisition pathway that and you would try sense. to make that but clear as you can in 2022, sense. knowing that yeah, not all of it would be right. okay. Another question then, because you also said no numbers, but in 2022 on your pathway up to 2030 in the interim, um, there, there could be numbers on, and, and at least we know there will be for efficiency, demand response and renewables, but there, there could be a variety of numbers. So when you say numbers, I'm not sure I know what that well, means. I, I just, I do not want to put us in a position of, of as, as Nicholas was saying, you know, putting some sort of target number out there and then being held to it when that's not um, part of the, the law. The law is you'll be in require, you'll be meeting the 8020 requirement by 2030, and you'll be making efforts to make progress towards meeting that obligation in 2030. And so for us to say, well, we're so much now, we're 100% in 2030, we just snap a, you know, a talk line or something incrementally get us there, that's a different um, view on progress than what we might have in making progress to do that. So I think that's the, that's the concern. I mean, absolutely, we'll get there. And it's going to be uh, as we uh, determine that it makes more sense for our, um, for our ratepayers and for Per our commission, right? And so uh, we can't, you know, that, or we shouldn't be put in the position of having to meet <laughs> targets that are that are not um, either attainable or or cost effective or whatever, just to be meeting a requirement in twenty third or twenty twenty three that's that's not a not a requirement. And, great. and actually, Liz, you have something? Yeah. Yes. Um, I want to make one clarification and draw one connection that hasn't been mentioned yet. So the clarification is under the language for the commission and the IOUs, it doesn't say the commission must approve, which was mentioned earlier today. It says the commission must by order approve, reject, or approve with conditions. So it's a plan, and I don't read that the commission has to approve it. But, um, but the Clean Energy Implementation Plan of the Eats Road is for those utilities that plan on meeting the standard with the 2% cost cap. And it seems like the utilities that aren't pursuing that path, the plan is a plan. You know, gives the company an idea of where you're going to make progress and how. But it's actually referenced in the section on the 2%. It seems like, you know, there's been a lot of discussion that it has no regulatory role. It's mostly a plan. And it reads like that's the case until you get to the 2% cost cap. And then it talks about, you know, you have to be spending 2% per year either to achieve their targets or the standards. So it seems like that's the one venue where it has different ways than it generally. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up the cost cap. We're actually going to be doing a joint um, workshop with UTC in February. So we'll have a great opportunity to, as you say, you know, kind of talk about this different way, um, you know, different chunk of the bill. 
So thank you for bringing that up. And also we're going to go ahead and turn it over here till next year. <laughs> but, you know, if there's things that are connected to this that you want to bring up, please do. Um, is there, and Johnny, I think you had your hand raised, Nicholas, you did? You're good? So um, there is a type of utility that we really haven't kind of hit on that I think is important to keep in mind. And that is a utility that is well above the 80% threshold whose plan to comply is to buy renewable energy credits. Some, several of the utilities that I work with um, are well above 90%. And I would argue that progress in that situation is kind of nonsensical because the standard is is that you're at 100% net, but up to 80% can be with um, must be with either non-emitting or um, or renewable resources. But the re other 20% can be met with you know recs and some other actions. But if you're already well above 80%, then I would assert that I'm going to Olympia. But Olympia is a big place, and you could end up here, or you could end up downtown, or you could end up at the farmer's market, or you could end up at other locations. You're still in the city of Olympia. In this situation, you're above 80%. You're, you have met that part of the requirement, and then however else you're going to get up to 100% net, I think doesn't even you know, gives you some options. And, and so anyway, I, I just think that that that's a large subset of the utilities that are going to be affected by this. And that's not, we haven't addressed that at all here. And so just for clarity, and then Kelly, can go to you. Are you saying that for utilities that are currently above 80% clean or with go direct compliance for that last 20% that they should have a different plan? There doesn't, we don't need to have language. What is the, well, I'm, I'm responding to a lot of the conversation most recently that said, you know, you have to make progress. You have to demonstrate making progress. Yeah. And it's almost a question rather than a statement. It's just, if you comply with the requirement, if, you, if you're a utility that's above 80% and you're subject to, um, uh, or above 85% and you're subject to the um, Energy Independence Act, come 2020, you're going to be above 100% net clean. And you will be for, for, through 2030. Seems to me that those people have complied with the requirement of the statute. Is there, there? Anyone want to respond? Sorry, Kelly. I mean, just going back to this progress, I, I do think that a lot of the language in section six is about consumer protection. And I think that even, let's say, you've met the 2030 uh, target, you still need to be continuously demonstrating progress towards the 2045 target. Uh, I think the, the intent was not to go from 80% clean in 2030 to um, continue to 80% clean for another 15 years and also <coughs> needing another 20% you know, uh, clean resources. So I, I do think that there's a consumer protection element here where um, the legislature wanted continuous progress towards that goal rather than that was. Uh, Can I ask you a question? The legislator wanted that progress. Why didn't they put it in the statute? Why didn't they put 82%? They could have done that. Yeah. All right, one second. If you're on the phone and you're not muted, can you just mute yourself? We're getting a lot of background noise. I think this discussion came up quite a bit during uh, development of the legislation, and that from all of you, every utility is unique and needs to demonstrate slightly different progress, and that for Puget is going to look very different. Than it will for Clark or Tacoma. And so they didn't define any specific percentage, but that each individual utility needs to create these targets based on their own unique portfolio. And I think just also step taking a step back from a really tactical perspective, we go back to these kinds of questions where we kind of started. So there's a deeper question about what does it mean to show progress and how we're going to measure that. But there's another question then of do we need to set rules about doing both, you know. For an auditor review at the beginning and the end and do, you know so i think separating those two out a little bit and getting some clarity on how people see what's the first and then kind of addressing these what i see as larger questions and 
don't know if that resonates or if people want to add in Johnny. I'd say Nicholas that you know yes it's going to be different for each one and it should always be showing progress and energy efficiency or some of the low income programs. I mean it's not just acquisition of resources. There's lots of things in the bill that talk about different aspects of the energy, the electric sector, number one. So maybe one of your utilities would take um, some creative action on energy efficiency that they have undertaken that. Um, uh, and I've forgotten the other point I was gonna make. So I'll come back to it. <laughs> and we'll have more chance, I think, to delve into that after the break as well, Johnny, what you just teed up. Um, I would like to uh, shift our discussion a little bit to the, the two topics, uh, you know, the two bullet points that uh, haven't got much attention yet. And it may be that they don't need a lot of attention, but uh, I'd like to check that out first. And that is around public involvement and uh, data availability. So I was reading the comments. Uh, I, um, I saw, you know, kind of a thread through that among the non-utility advocates that, you know, where they were, uh, you know, anticipating that uh, it may be hard to set substantive requirements uh, in the rules, you know, that a plan, uh, you know, maybe shouldn't have a lot of highly specific rules uh, applied to it that uh, transparency and uh, customer involvement was important. It's more about process type of thing. And so um, it's been my impression over the years in the IRP area that um, the approaches to public involvement uh, are very different, even though it's one statute that applies to IOUs and the consumer-owned utilities, we have a lot of uh, variations. And so uh, I'd be interested in whether anybody sees a need for more definition for rules around either the public involvement part or the uh, data availability provisions in that section. Can I just ask a quick clarifying question, Lynn? Did you, because I have that on the, on the board over there, are you, is this referring to the this entire CEDA process, including the IRP, or is this targeted specifically at the four year clean energy implementation? I'm really thinking about it in terms of the CEIP specifically. Any thoughts on transparency, either in public involvement or availability? I have a thought on the, this is an app from South Sea Light. Aren't all the plans going to have to go through a CEDA process for public involvement? She said S E P A. State. So I said C E I P. C E I P. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You didn't say SEPA then? S E P A? No, I said we will need to go through a SEPA process for review for each of our C E I P. So the SEPA process is what? It's a non project environmental review of the impacts of the plan. Okay, so we did hear her right, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sorry for all the confusion. Yeah. All right. <laughs> but as far as public involvement, that would like have part of the process would probably be pretty similar to IRPs. Yeah, if I can jump in here. Um, I know that Bonneville, when it does like its research <laughs> program, it, it does it under NEPA, correct, Liz? And Seattle City Light, who's one of the utilities I help with IRPs, is the only utility I'm aware of in the state that does a SEPA for its integrated resource plans. I'm not aware of any other utility that currently uh, uh, uses a SEPA process for that. Yeah. Seattle's unique in that okay. regard. Can, Can I make a comment on the phone? There we, that was amazing timing. Um, I was just going to pause and see if there's anyone on the phone that wanted to jump in. Please go ahead. Yeah, this is this is uh, Greg Mendonca with PNGC, and I appreciate the the conversation around the uh, CEIP plans. I, I wanted to, and I think I think uh, this was brought up, but I did want to touch on it and express a concern regarding those uh, 
uh, small to very small utilities and their abilities to um, to do something uh, along the, the lines of uh, the CEIP on, on a four-year basis. And I wanted to highlight, and this is something that we work on with, with Liz and BPA, uh, those full requirements customers of Bonneville who really have no ability to plan to do anything outside of, of what BPA allows them to do. Um, and so how it interweaves with uh, setting a plan and then really having no control over, over what resource we get. We, we're at the mercy of what BPA gives us. And then having some sort of um, check back and audit on whether our guess was good or not. I, I just want to express the concern that that smaller utilities, uh, specifically load following customers of BPA, are, are probably in a position of very little control over, over what's going on. Um, and, and I think uh, it's something that I, that I want to bring up and I want to highlight as, as a specific uh, issue that, that probably needs to be addressed in, in regards to all of the procedural requirements around doing these 10-year plans. And, and I think uh, some, something that needs to be brought up and thought of, I know I've talked a little bit about it with Glenn as well. Tom, do you want to ask one? Bernard, I wanted to piggyback on what, he, what you're saying and uh, in that in looking at what's required in a CEIP utility, pursue all cost-effective, reliable conservation. You know how EIA qualifying utilities pursue that under the EIA with their CPAs. How, do, how is somebody like he's describing supposed to do it when they're kind of bound to low phone? I, I, it's, I'm not sure how this would play out with one of the utilities he's describing. Liz, I want to, oh, sorry. Just to Go ahead. Well, I was just going to suggest that the language isn't quite what uh, you said, Tom. It says that, uh, that as well as specific targets for energy efficiency, demand response, and renewable energy, that's not the same as all energy efficiency. So, you know, there, all right, you yeah. have targets, but it's not all cost. It doesn't say all cost effective. Time for uh, two more. So Doug Kelly, and then we'll. Yeah, I mean, just kind of going back to the the public engagement. I think that, um, especially around some of the the public interest benefits language, that is, um, you know, this framework around making sure that um, highly impacted communities are benefiting, and that we're taking into consideration uh, environmental and public health uh, considerations. I think it's really important that communities uh, have the opportunity to engage if, if they want to. Um, so I, I do think it's really important that that is uh, this. So, uh, this is Nicholas Garcia. I just want to respond, just just as a fact, not not as a uh, opinion here. When I used to do this, it was extraordinarily difficult to get public to come. That's I mean, why I said if they would like to, there should yeah. be an opportunity for engagement. I, I realize that might be really hard with a very small utility. But even. The not small utility I worked with, it was really difficult to get people to come. And you know, we would send out notices, we would we would call people up saying, please come to our meetings. And two people. And you have cookies. Yes, we have <laughs> <laughs> <That's not laughs> So you were the other I wanted to uh, speak to Glenn's question about public participation, public involvement, and I think there's going to be a difference between the IOUs and the COUs, and I, I think there's probably going to be a difference between the COUs. But, um, since they, that they, the Clean Energy Implementation Plan on the face of it is going to have such a profound um, impact on the IRP, and the IRP structure itself, there's a lot of questions about what changes are needed for public participation around the IRP. I don't think what you want is to is to have a, a plan that has a, the import that the Clean Energy Implementation Plan will have and not have that be going through uh, an opportunity for rigorous public engagement like an IRP, because it really would be a disservice if you come with a fully blank plan and then think that your your public review of it is going to be then with when it's when it's being incorporated into the IRP that's almost after the fact that's not helpful 
So I think you got to be at least considering some parallel level of engagement on the development of the of the CIP, the CEIP. That's very similar to what we have uh, with the IRP process, knowing we still need improvements in the IRP process. Eric, did you want to jump in? I was just going to respond to the kind of if they're interested question. I mean, I think that's a lot of the design element. And um, I think what questions we're asking who and making sure we're asking relevant questions to the people affected. So I think there, we, we can't just assume that we hold a meeting, no one comes, but people are interested in questions. And I think it's an important part of the process uh, as much as possible supporting utilities and, and helping identify those processes uh, to be better and more effective public participation. Johnny, we'll end with you. Yeah, I was going to say I wouldn't use historic experience experience as your uh, measure for going forward. I mean, and I'm looking at Phil at the moment. When I got up here six years ago, the PSC meetings had or your IRP meetings had what six people show up that weren't staff, and the meetings now have 35 or 40 or whatever the number is of public citizens showing up at these meetings. And I think that's uh, something that the public is discovering. It's not just cars. It's not just factories that are, you know, that are emitters that affect their lives. It's also utilities. And so it will be uneven across all the utilities, but I think you should expect a desire from the public to be more involved. Help when those IRP meetings are live tweeted as well. So. Um, all right. So we're going to take a break. Uh, thank you so much. We're going to have more opportunity to dig into some of the specifics that we've touched on. So. Stick around, uh, let's come back at 2.30. And then actually, I'm sorry, real quick, just for some housekeeping before you guys stand up. Um, if you'll notice at three o'clock, we're gonna have a discussion of key substantive provisions. We've listed two things. This is, this is, wait, wait, can I get your attention real quick? Everyone real quick, real quick. Okay, real, real quick. So um, at three o'clock, we have a discussion of key substantive provisions. We put two examples here, resource adequacy standard and targets and demonstration of progress. We also are asking for topics. So. If during the break there's stuff that came up here that you want to do into more, please put it on a post-it or a index card that are all around the table and hand them to me, and we'll include them on our three o'clock discussion. And uh, bathrooms out the door to the left. Now you may. And these can be out of the IRP section too, so it doesn't have to be just Sorry, section six. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. See you back at two thirty. <laughs>
Well, the deadline for 2022, my, concern, my practical concern is that development plan is going to be a year-long process. So unless, for anything that's not decided by the end of 2021, it's unlikely it's going to be able to be incorporated in 22. So you should go start doing modeling and you're going to be doing public outreach and talking. And so I just worry a little bit about the standard you're going to be held to about what the plan would be for things that are not fully baked, fully settled, you know, in 20, by the end of 2021. Glenn, do you want to say anything about that? Should we just use that as a segue to jump in <laughs> to our next one? Um, well, we're planning to wrap up this rulemaking at the end of 2020. So, then I won't do it. That seems right. You can solve problems. <laughs> okay, um, so the next section is on loosely on intersections and dependencies, um, meaning between you know the clean energy implementation plan and all these sort of other existing parts of statute, uh, you know, so IRP, but also the requirements um, that live kind of across things. And so, you know, we've pulled together some bullets here based on comments. Um, and these are mostly kind of suggestions based on, you know, what was given to us. Um, so some of the things that we can think about in terms of these intersections and dependencies include, you know, deadlines around the IRP and how they intersect um, with, the, with the CEIP, the Clean Energy Action Plan and its 10-year cycle. Um, you know, some of these references and, um, you know, this long-range resource plan and what that means how that intersects with the EIA, and then as well as the equitable distribution um, language in 4.8. So these are just some examples, but um, to kind of get us started, uh, we had we had heard from uh, Steve Taylor at Callis 
um, about kind of just even the idea about the, the upcoming IRPs that we have. And so, Steve, I'm just going to go ahead and let you kind of explain what comments you brought to us and, and put some of the questions out to the group. So go for it. Thank you. So um, with the UTC's uh, recent consideration and with action taken last week uh, to um, uh, postpone or, or waive the IRP submission for IOUs based upon the fact that um, the new CETA rules have not been uh, established yet. Um, the UTC said, hey, we'd like to focus our, our time uh, in developing the rules rather than reviewing IRPs that are based on um, uh, based on old rules or, or, or an incomplete process. And uh, so uh, I thought, well, I wonder if that same logic could be applied to um, utilities that um, have their IRPs due uh, in September of, of next year. Uh, Palace is one of them. Um, if the rules, especially related to um, the amendments made to the IRP statute, um, if those are not going to be ready until the end of next year, um, then you know we would rather not. Uh, we'd rather not guess as to you know what needs to be included in there. Um, but uh, uh, either have some type of progress report uh, um, included uh, by September of next year and then hold off on IRP until a later date. Um, I know this might monkey up some um, other deadlines as it pertains to the development of that first CEIP. Um, so uh, maybe pushing out the next IRP to 2022 isn't congruent with getting your CEIP um, uh, submitted, because that's supposed to be submitted on January 1st of 2022. And the fact that your IRP contains your new Clean Energy Action Plan component, which is supposed to inform the CEIP. So the CEAP informs the CEIP and not the other way around. Um, so, but again, I don't know where this process could go versus uh, how the UTC went in their direction. Um, the statute does say you have to have your IRPs done within particular time frames. Um, and uh, so making any requests to waive a requirement to complete an IRP next year, I uh, just want to make sure that that is not <coughs> going to run counter to, to the statute. Thinking in practical terms here, we want to go through a, a process uh, and submit a document that's really perfunctory um, just to check a box and not really have the, the public guidance. Uh, now, in discussing this with, with some of my colleagues, um, you know, there's going to be planning going on um, regardless of having to submit uh, you know, a, a plan formally. Uh, it's just we all have our planning processes and forms a lot of our operations. So um, really this question would be, is this, uh, would there be an option for utilities uh, to not submit an IRP due uh, next September uh, until at least the rules are completed by the end of the year? And I want to give other utilities in the room a chance to respond or, you know, saying that sounds great. Um, can I ask you a question? Johnny can start with a question. Do you do your IRPs every four years or every two years like the IOUs do? Yeah, so we do them every four years and we do our progress reports every two years. So we can basically do any IRP, just a few pages less. Any other clarifying questions actually before? Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. I was, you know, I'm, I'm new uh, to my role and uh, kind of public power. And I was looking to see currently the way I understand it for consumer owned utilities, um, there aren't any commerce rules. Is that true? When That's it comes true. to IRPs? Mm -hmm. okay. That's right. And so the extent of the relationship is it's submitting the IRP to commerce, is that right? And then we uh, compile that information and uh, put it into a report that goes to the legislature and is posted on the website okay and then and from what i can see in the bill you have authority over kind of the timing of of that submission 
right? Some direction that the department will yeah. determine the timing. I, of, I, of I, I sort of have that same reaction. I'm not quite sure what that says. Okay. Either, so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. I have it clear in my head. Thank you. <laughs> then that also goes to that the new language. I think it's in sub eight there, or section fourteen, where um, talks about the intervals, and uh, it appears to be giving commerce more discretion on the intervals of requiring IRPs. <laughs> Thoughts or response or questions? Yeah, Nicholas. Uh, just one other thought. Right now, the intervals say you have to do it at least every four years. I remember when I was doing them, um, at one point we decided to do it every three years. There was a specific reason for that. And I don't remember exactly why at this moment. But my, my question is do you envision, does Commerce envision these being done? Every, every utility doing it on the same, you know, submit it in December of every four years, or is it, if someone wanted to submit it in three years or two and a half years, is that a problem? I, I'm, you know, do you want to sort of get a slug of them all at once, or do you, do you want, is it, do you have any issues with them, people providing them whenever it's convenient for them? Uh, this is Glenn Blackman, and, um, you know, I've noticed in the uh, we compile the IRPs that they there is some variation among them already uh, in terms of exactly when they're completing them. Uh, that's one reason why when we're putting the agenda together, and I, I put a little question mark after the 9-1-2020 date because I'm not entirely sure that all of the several utilities are exactly on that cycle where everybody is, you know, under current law planning to produce a full uh, IRP. And by everybody, I mean the ones that are required to do an IRP under uh, that statute. Um, or whether there are people who are, you know, a year earlier or something like that. I, I'm just not sure. What we've done in terms of compiling is everybody's year zero as year zero and then we measure five years out so we're doing it 2018 you know for some utilities year zero is 2017 and others are 2019 and um, then we look at what they thought they would have acquired five years after that or ten years after that now uh, here where end up with uh, needing to tie in with the CEIPs and the four-year periods. It may be that there's more of a need to do things up more precisely than there has been in the past. Um, so I'm not sure. It, it, but in the past, it, it really did not made any effort or felt any need to uh, line those things up that way. I guess my question was, do you feel any need at this point to, to line them up? And I'd say maybe. <laughs> you know, you know it, it, it does. It may be that uh, they don't need to line up exactly, but it does seem like they need to feed into uh, plans to cover these two, three uh, periods before we get to 2030. And I, if I could just. Uh, things up a little bit. I know that um, Seattle City Light has also done some looking at how to uh, sequence its work. So if you want to talk about that, that might be helpful too. Can you repeat the question? <laughs> yeah, about uh, adjustments that you've made to the timing of your uh, IRP to accommodate the fact that the, we've got this new law passed. I, I think that we were anticipating that we would go forward with the original deliverable for our IRP as we have planned. And so basically that would like have a change to when we would, um, when our next horizon would be. So, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, so what, under your current? Do, do you have some different information? Well, no, I'm just, I have, we sent a letter, Seattle, this is Andy from City Life, we sent a letter to Commerce back in 
clarifying our intent for this um, because we're, we're turning that in September 1st, 2020. Um, and um, what we are saying is, uh, in our case, the 2020 IRP will need to incorporate the specific intent of CDAC, but we are not going to have all of the details incorporated into our IRP, and we have two years. Uh, cycles for our IRP. So um, that's that's the way we we were planning on doing it. Okay, so you're you're maintaining the schedule and then the adjusting kind of or you know waiting to do some of the specific provisions until right. the next cycle. Right. Okay. Saying that as much as practical, we will Adhere to the spirit yeah. and intent and see that but there may be specifics um, that aren't um, set in time for us. That scales. For Tacoma Power, we're pretty much aligned with that. <laughs> but acknowledging there, there will be inputs coming from. Cumulative impact analysis and other pieces of CETA that we will time. Yeah, so for us, it's likely that we wouldn't just do, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm, I'm pretty sure that we would more, something more like a full wire again rather than an update. Two-year second would be a full IRP. Anyone else want to weigh in about either a process they're considering at their utility, um, or one that they've talked about, but want to just get some feedback on, or any other kind of comments about Steve's proposal about pushing off the IRP to September 2020? Um, well, this is, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Garrison, it's Nahomish uh, from the phone. Yeah, I, I just wanted to offer that, you know, the, it's Nahomish, uh, one of the reasons why we have kind of the timing and the cadence that we do is uh, we use the integrated portfolio approach for a conservation acquisition too. So the IRP informs our conservation acquisition. Uh, we also see uh, CETA helping us set up our 10-year our action plan and our clean energy implementation plan, and we'd really love that to be, you know, a really uh, cohesive planning process that we can do a really, you know, thorough and thoughtful job on. And we also have to uh, budget for the acquisition uh, that could come next. And so we try and coincide that as well with our own internal budgeting process. So there really is, you know, kind of a lot uh, involved in the timing of some of these, you know, different processes that take place. Um, some of the conversation I heard earlier was, you know, kind of one size fit all in potentially. And, you know, we're just so different, you know, even if we're all COUs in the room uh, from each other with different needs and, you know, really appreciate that flexibility so that we can have something that serves our customers really great. When you say you're cadence, so am I taking what you're saying that you would rather not um, pull off? Like you would rather do your your September 2020 uh, IRP and not push it back. Uh, have kind we, of all the processes connected. We're on a different cadence than most of uh, our peers, so we filed early. So our our next uh, IRP isn't due for a, a while out. We just uh, adopted our IRP in May of uh, this last year, so we're planning on finishing the work, including all of the uh, CETA. Uh, pieces to it and finishing the analysis in June 2021 and filing shortly thereafter. So what I'm proposing is not to say <coughs> so those utilities who want to do an IRP, no, you can't do one. But if you want to go ahead and do it, I mean, no, no problem. I, we just want to know what what does commerce think and what does you know, folks in the think about those utilities want the option to not go through that process and submit the document until after the rule? 
rules are complete. I mean, it's really that simple of a question. Um, but uh, we don't want to, um, you know, put a monkey wrench in, into other utilities IRP processes when they have that built into their overall um, their overall operational plans. Because again, each each utility is, is different. Thanks for that clarification. So I guess the kind of open question then is: Are there any concerns just about the option anyway to have that kind of um, process take place? Johnny, I just have a question. Um, would it? Is there any reason that you, if you're, I'm not quite sure where your timing is exactly. Is there, there is no reason you could do your CEIP early. I mean, it says you have to get it in by 2022. What if you did it by snow plan 2021 or whatever the schedule is you're currently on for your next IRP or the CEIP? Right. So, so, well, the CEIP would still just be due January 1st of 2022. Right, but yeah, we're assuming all the rules will be in place. But it's by that date, year. so you could do it early. For the CEIP, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I just, but our IRP update, which is supposed to contain the, the 10 year plan energy action plan, uh -huh. is supposed to be due next September. And we won't have the rules for that. And so, so we're just saying, can we postpone that until September of 2020? 2020, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I was just that. I mean, I guess what I was throwing out there is as an option. Would you be willing to look at, say, doing your CEIP early to be on that schedule? Because it's done by 2020. I'm just trying to think of other angles on that. Because yeah. I'm not quite sure. Because the law says you need to do this date if you've been on a four year schedule. That's your date. Right. 2018 plus. plus yeah, year. for us yeah. in our last IRP, the full IRP was in 2016. Right. So that's, that's a, does the statute say, to get it done within four years if you have not done a new irp within four years this is not even an option and i believe with, with yeah. the ious you can do an irps full irps every two years yeah, right. so that might keep you within the statute but it was the reasoning that was within the utc's filing from the staff saying do we want to put this time and effort into you know, doing irps and for the utilities to be developing these irps that aren't going to meet uh, the, the, the rules and the, the language of, of CETA, or do we focus our efforts on new rules and guidelines and then uh, have the next IRP yeah. that's due uh, be in compliance with law? Yeah, I think that the UTC, John, Phil, correct me, I think what they called this one was a progress report, which is allowed under statute, and they're calling this what we were calling the 219 progress report. With the next full one ready, or what we talked about at the meeting last week was the draft would be turned into January of 2021, and the final in April or May, I can't remember which, 2021, is it April? Okay, with with a little leeway because it's actually not done due uh, until late. But given that we'll be working out rules for the IOUs on that, they're in you know, time with this and getting to that point. And a number of us submitted questions about particular stuff. How would the Conservation potential be calculated if you're not having an acknowledged IRP, you know, that kind of right. thing, or how PACs, you know, their resource acquisition. So that was, um, but that was because they were on a two year cycle. So they're still going to end up doing two, but we'll be doing it earlier actually to make sure that everything's incorporated <coughs> and then it works out. That was the earlier time. than our four year yeah, requirement, it's, but yeah. it's well beyond what we've been planning right, to totally do. Right. Other follow up from what Steve has brought up, and again, for other things at the table, um, you know, we had also brought in the idea of the clean energy action plan, which kind of came up, um, and just how the timing of that plays in. So, if there's any thoughts on that, and then I think also a good clarification since we have a lot of minds at the table is uh, that third bullet point uh, the CEIP reference to long range resource plan. Um, the way everyone's talking, it seems that is synonymous with IRP. Is that how everyone is thinking about it, or is anyone that thought about that as something different than an IRP? <coughs> I just wanted to kind of take a pulse, uh, beat on that one real quick. That would be in the 19405060 uh, uh, little four. 
Are you talking about a clean energy action plan? Is no, so there's the clean energy action plan right on that 10 year cycle. Right. And then there's just a reference to in the CEIP language to a long range resource plan. So it says uh, identifies. So the CEIP has to identify specific actions to be taken by the consumer owned utility over the next four years, consistent with utilities long range resource plan and resource adequacy requirements. So just this idea that this utilities long range resource plan, the way everyone's talking, it seems like most people are thinking of everyone's thinking about that as the IRP. Just want to make sure we're not all talking about a super secret special fit <laughs> plan. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. You know? Real overachievers in the room. So. I, I think the resource plan is referencing those utilities that are not necessarily bound by the IRP statute. I think there's some special language in 280 that says for all other utilities, they can develop a resource plan right, right, in the right. group of IRP. So I'm guessing that language is to be inclusive. Of everything. Okay, yeah, great. Appreciate that. I feel like general agreement around the room on that. Okay. Um, and then also kind of folded in there is and we talked about it a little so our, and we only have about five minutes left so if someone wanted to jump in around the EIA targets and you know just uh, how to line up some of the conservation targets and planning we need to do with the two-year uh, EIA requirements as well as the four-year CEIP any thoughts it sounds like kind of the seed of C's question really <laughs> it helps push out that but if there's anything you know, if everyone feels comfortable when they're going to do their next RP, but if there's any questions going forward about lining up other requirements, I guess, as a general question. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Ian Hunter with Snohomish. Um, we've brought up a couple of times the, the EIA conservation potential target is on a two year basis, whereas the conservation or energy efficiency targets specified by the CEIP are on a four year basis. And so you may be in the position that when you update your EIA target, you would have different targets between your CEIP and your EIA target. And the, the solution that we proposed was that when you, whenever you update your EIA target, you can optionally update your CEIP target as well to match. So updating the CIP with the EIA, is that the same thing? The potential it's there? Is the presumably the EIA target would have the most recent information in it. You would want your CEIP plan to start to match that. Yeah. Any other thoughts about that or concerns? Um, in our last few minutes, I also want to pause and see if anyone on the phone had anything they wanted to add to this conversation. Go ahead and just unmute yourselves and speak up if you'd like to. Um, do you think, Ian, there's any um, kind of more that needs to be done around process for that in terms of discounting for this or, you know, in this, in this suggestion that you've made? Or is that an open question that you think? I think, it's a, I think it's an open question. Um, from our point of view, we're viewing the EIA conservation target as what we're uh, statutorily bound to, and since we've mentioned before that we view CEIP as more of a planning target, we would want to be consistent in our internal planning and for external stakeholders, uh, but we would want the CEIP target to be in compliance with the EIA target. We want these to be compliant with each other. <laughs> I think aligned. Pretty. Yes. Yeah, sure. I would just say from an audit perspective, we're already looking at the two-year conservation targets, so that element's being taken care of for the qualifying utilities and that for us. It's, so from SAO's perspective, this wouldn't be compliance, wouldn't, this wouldn't be an issue in terms of compliance. Right, if we would just point back to our work on two-year conservation targets. Uh, okay. No additional. Any other last thought on this? Yeah, Sean. Yep. So just another fourth bullet point there, uh, 04 sub 8, um, just the inclusion of that in the CEIP document um, and how that would demonstrate what elements of, of what 
specific elements that need to be in there. Okay. 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 So actually, that might be a good. If we want, we can bring that into the next half hour. Pretty much at time for this section. So we can go ahead and just roll right into that if y'all want. Um, so this is so. First off, did anybody write anything on a post-it or a index card that they wanted to add to the section? If so, you can just pass that forward. Um, so this is just sort of kind of any outstanding things we have to chat about today, which is a lot. But um, some of the things we put down were resource adequacy standard targets and demonstration of progress. So you know any other places where a methodology or standard really needs to be kind of dug into a bit. Um, I think this is a great place to start if we want. So uh, this is in section 4.408 around the equitable distribution provision. So Sean, did you want to elaborate a little bit more on kind of questions you have about this or well, sure. what you about in terms of operationalizing that? Yeah, so it was looking at some of the language, uh, pointing out one you know, specific element of that, say reduction of costs and risks. So. Um, Foresee there being some very specific ways of reducing costs to consumers uh, who, who meet the low income, vulnerable, uh, highly impacted communities. And so, in the plan, I guess what I would expect would be uh, a delineation of those specific programs, whether they be uh, existing low income authorization programs, uh, the utility operates or uh, uh, funds in partnership with other organizations. Similarly, with um, a rate discount or energy assistance type program, or uh, and or um, the community solar type programs where they've got uh, enrollment in uh, of specific carve outs for the like. I have a follow up on that. Um, how do you is that a different that's different than section twelve? I, I think I think it needs, from my perspective. It belongs in the plan to demonstrate compliance. In the CDMP separately and from whatever utilities are going to do for section four. Yes. But I think they're you know, related. I think it's no, correct. I just it, I'm just talking about in terms of like strictly like a compliance and reporting mechanism. It's not going to be it's going to be something separate than what's owed in section four. It needs to be an element of the CDMP. Okay. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. Uh, do you want it to be an element of the CEIP or would it be part of the requirements under 19280, kind of the IRP section, which I think already has a, a component of that or an assessment under sub K? That's specifically the health impacts. Analysis that you're referring to? Uh, it's an assessment informed by the cumulative impact of analysis under 1905140 of energy and non energy benefits and reduction in burdens, vulnerable populations, and highly impacted communities, long term and short term public health, and environmental benefits, costs and risks, and energy security and risk. And that's in the IRP statute. Right. And I think this is in, would be in addition to that. So, in addition. Yeah. And, and part of that, just to comment on that, is that I mean, specifically what it says is about in the clean energy transition. And if this is a plan that's really outlining that part, then it should be included in that um, in the CDIP as well as the IRP, which is kind of a broader. Going on top of that, though, I think there's also a, another kind of layer of, of, of kind of potential benefits and burdens um, beyond kind of the um, customer facing um, programs that could be explored. So I think. Uh, clearly kind of outlining what are the, the impacts um, from you know, utilities operations in this transition um, that have you know, benefits and how they're actually distributed. Um, thinking about you know, what are the methodologies to actually assess the distributional questions, which it alludes to that uh, section 24 on the cumulative impacts analysis, but there are also additional kind of ways to look at um, um, what's happening from a utility perspective. Um, and that's my thread there. But um, yeah, broadly, there's, I, I think, more additional things to look at. Um, and it's important that it's in the CEIP so we can actually say it's being plain formed to assess compliance, which is where it actually occurs. Um, Lisa, I need to come. Oh, I just had a follow-up on that question. Um, because Section 12, um, as part of the data that the utilities have to 
outside of commerce it leads to an assessment and a plan um, requirements for utilities on and um, specifically for the equity piece which I think we're talking about low income assistance that seems a little duplicative though or either that or I mean I just think they have to be integrated somehow so we don't have one process under section 12 completing a plan that we submit to commerce and then we have another requirement under the site I just wanted to pose that yeah, I think those would inform each other um, and the way I'm envisioning an implementation plan would be the, the timeline the programs the process for how how the how meeting the requirements Section 12 are, are going to occur. I mean, Section 12 is reporting up to commerce the specifics associated with the need, uh, et cetera, but the programs themselves would be outlined in the CPIP. Well, it says uh, the assessment required um, must include a plan to improve the effectiveness of right. assess mechanisms and strategies for meeting the energy assistance need. And some more things. Um, so, I get, I mean, that, that sounds like a plan and how we would be able to do that, which probably would also include other forms of um, or sources of funding, uh, potentially, other than just repair dollars. But so I see that as maybe sufficient. I don't know. Um, but you want to you want an actual plan, a dramatic plan to put into the CEIP? So I'm going to give Sean a second to respond, and then Kelly, and then I think I see uh, Eleanor and Johnny Pins. Go ahead. Who'd like to respond? Go ahead. Uh, you're asked a direct question. The answer would be yes. Okay. Oh, did he? Kelly. Yeah, I mean, I would agree with this. I, I think that we need to be careful with um, 12, section 24, that, that mentions the cumulative impact analysis, and then this you know, public interest benefits language. They There's a lot of overlap with all of them, but they are separate. and. You know, low income is a little more targeted to low income programs that uh, is certainly included in uh, some of this broader language, but it's that, that's not the, the full language. And I think the same with the cumulative impact analysis, that's going to identify which communities need to be targeted. But um, part of this language that we're talking about is more broadly how utilities are investing in resources and who's benefiting and what benefits are actually considered. Um, so an example that I've used in the past here is that, you know, the legislature has clarified that uh, climate impacts need to be included, uh, and we're using the social cost of carbon to do that. We need to come up with other metrics for the planning process to, to incorporate some of these public health benefits and other um, benefits that are, that are laid out uh, in that language. Uh, I wanted to double check. I saw you two had your hands up. And... Yeah, I would just say that. Um, uh, this is Eleanor. Right? <laughs> that it's clear that Section 4A applies to the clean energy and public plans, and it is a broader authority than what is required under Section 4A. Section 4A. Sorry, I can't Section. It's a broader authority than Section, section 12. 6. Well, well, I just, you know, I think that we do, we do a disservice to ourselves to say, oh, there's duplication, but we don't go about it in the most efficient way possible. Um, we're integrating like an integrated resource plan we're integrating information from these other processes not having separate three individual separate packages okay um looking at this i mean i would like to just step back and say section 24 is a cumulative <coughs> impact assessment it's being done by the department of health parts of which <coughs> And it will get better over time. Some of that detail will go to commerce for their report. And this part in 12 4 um, B, where you're talking about the assessment in this subsection, includes a plan to improve the effectiveness of the assessed mechanisms and strategies for its meeting the energy assistant needs of low income parties. And 14 K is then talking about. Mm -hmm. Of your IRP work is an assessment informed by the cumulative impact analysis and taking some of that data from there again to make sure that your energy and non energy benefits and reductions to burdens to vulnerable populations, not just your energy assess, uh, assistance programs. So they do relate 
and you'll be doing both of them. I think you're taking parts of those plans and putting them into the CEIP and and also including them in the IRP. Well, I hope we didn't intend to duplicate anything. I think they can be used both ways. CEIP. Yes. So, question? Michael um, Fund. Again, a lot of the utilities I work with come into this equation at more than 90% clean. So, I'm just curious if you're a utility that Let's just say, for the sake of argument, it's a full requirements customer on EPA. You have no control over the your energy, where the energy comes from. But there's no thermal resources in your service territory. You can guarantee that from thermal generating resources. And um, you start off with very low rates, but you do have a assistance program for low income customers. Would it would that scenario? Would the utility be in compliance with eight in your mind, or would there be a requirement that they do something beyond that? Because I'm struggling to think of what they could do. By eight, you mean subsection eight of uh, of four oh? Yes. Section four. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Four oh five, oh four oh sub eight. I'm happy to respond to that. I mean, reduction of cost can occur through something other than just bill assistance. Something other than what? Bill assistance. Actual efficiency improvements, reduced costs. No, when I say assistance, it could be efficiency. It could right. be. Yeah, the broader context of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you, their question is is there more it, that they could be doing besides that? The question is would that be something? They have the program, they have a conservation program. They already start off extraordinarily clean. They have no thermal resources in their service territory. Would they, by definition, be in compliance in your in your mind with eight? I think and there's other components in terms of the public health, and security, and resiliency. So I think that's what's obviously why we're here. But you don't have any control over that because you're a full requirements customer of EPA. I think it's you know at some level you're you're following your dollar spend as a way to see like where where is procurement happening you're obviously your resource generation piece is maybe fairly fixed but there are other questions with within the operations that maybe you have more control of so those are the, the pieces what are, what do you have control over what are the impacts of those what are the distributional questions of those impacts this raises just a question I've had all along um, particularly I think it's section 14 and you do the cumulative analysis and it's supposed to take in the climate and if you are an extremely clean utility so you are not in any way adding fossil in the communities or in fact your maybe your electricity source will be part of cleaning up through transportation so we can't take i5 out of our service area you know we can't actually kick out customers or do anything like that so if if you this is where i want to i really want to understand where you see environmental benefits for an electric utility starting and ending because legally our council will tell us we you know we see the sub benefits of electrification transportation for instance for clean air i mean that's what we truly believe in but legally if we're going to make a business case to do electrification transportation it, it can't be based on those kind of broader general public good investments it has to be something direct to our rate payers so i just it makes me uneasy sometimes um but I think there are some legal parameters on utilities on the, where where it ends, where ratepayer money can be extended. There's cases like Okison, um, for instance, on streetlights, you know, where there's a definitive distinction between what ratepayer money could be spent on. It wasn't streetlights because that was a public benefit. But you know, so I, I I'm just bringing this up because we do have some legal parameters that we have to think about, which might not really be, you know assist nicely with maybe what your expectations are so not not yeah i mean I, putting I, those I down think, i yeah, just think, I think that's that we've got some constraints yeah I was reasonable perspective to have and i'm and I, I yeah. not suggesting that mm -hmm. we cross subsidizing ratepayer funds to do public health work per se okay. um we we're talking about meeting specific requirements here and i think you have a valid point nicholas in terms of Lack of control over some of the. Well, it's not reasonable to expect the utility to have control over up 
upstream conditions. And so I don't think we're trying to make that argument. So I, I'm not convinced. I could, this is Johnny. I could see under this section 14K where once you've looked at your assistance programs and what's coming from the cumulative impact assessment, you might be looking at how would you do some distributed energy resources siting, or how would you do some transportation electrification? Would you really be looking at electric buses in a neighborhood per se, or close to I five? You know, try to reduce the impacts on them. I mean, that's that's kind of what I think we yeah. need to. In, no, in and I, I think under the alternative compliance, there's a mechanism to do that, and and we're going to be making yeah. those investments because we're going to be having a plan. We because yeah. we do see the benefit. I just my point was though. Cleaning up air pollution is not really within our legal purview, right. although we see it and recognize it as a very important secondary benefit of anything we might do. So that's why distributed generation, if we keep our limits at what it is right now, would not improve air quality. All things staying the same right now. But they would affect the but distribution trip. of benefits. So it's also right. It's not just about cleaner without how those things are already being distributed. Now choices you're already making are benefiting some or others. Well, we definitely will have an equity lens on whatever we have to do. It's kind of universal. Yeah. Can I kind of take us up a level? Um, I, I'm looking at the statutory requirements of the CEIP for consumer owned utilities specifically. I'm seeing that the plan is focused around the standards established under RCW 19405-0401 and the interim targets are for 19405-0401 um, and also in section sub four, the specific actions are under 19405-0401. And so because section, the, the language in section four, eight is being proposed to be included in CDIP, I'm not sure there's a statutory basis for that. This, the requirements in 0408 would be part of your compliance filing to prove that you're in compliance with section 040, but not necessarily part of your CEIP. I'm not saying the utilities wouldn't take that into account as they do their CEIP, but it's not an explicit requirement by statute to do so or to spell it out. So I, I put that question out there. Can you repeat the question one more time? The question would be, is there a statutory basis to include uh, 040 sub 8 in the CEIP? Mandate. Mandate. Anyone want to respond to that? I just argued I'd make is there is a link between planning and compliance. So if, even if it's not explicit that the plans are supposed to get to, to in compliance, and so there's an implication that um, you should be planning as, as a pathway towards that. Yeah, I just add that it says um, in compliance with the section in 4A, and then in, in 6 where you're we're talking about established under 4.1 and 5.1, I think there is a clear nexus there um, between the two, um, and be clear in the law. I don't see that. Yeah, I mean, I think we can look at section one. Basically, from the start, we have pretty clear direction about equitable distribution, uh, affordable rates, et cetera. So, I mean, I think arguing technicalities, uh, some eight. So they said one fair point, but I think that there's enough here demonstrating the legislative I, I, I guess my, my response to that would just be when I look at the CEIP, I look at a pretty narrow planning document for how you're going to reach compliance with the planning standard, which is one. And while you are going to have to eventually make your Case to the auditor that you complied with section eight, I don't necessarily I wouldn't necessarily have an obligation to put that in my planning document. You're going to demonstrate your, your, your compliance by which means that so you have to demonstrate. It just says you must ensure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
I think we mentioned this. So in complying with the section, you're saying is not compliance is insured? I'm sorry. I, I'm just saying that when when I make my filing, my O40 filing. I'm going to be saying this is under section one. This is the obligation that I had to meet. And then there's the caveats for section two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And so when the auditor comes and looks at my filing and says, were you in compliance? Yes or no. I would have to include my 040 filing something that would say, yes, I'm in compliance with all of these subsections. But in the CEIP language, the planning document. So my planning document would only be inclusive of the things that the auditor would say, these are the components of the plan you're required to include, which is only targeting 0401. And I'm not saying that utilities wouldn't think about these things or wouldn't necessarily put them into a CEIP and say, here's how we're thinking about this. I'm just asking the question, does commerce have authority to make the rules around this and include it when there's not a statutory directive? Right, and I'm saying that by, re by referring back to 4.1 and 5.1, it's incorporating that requirement. That's my response. Sorry, did you have a comment? I, just, I don't want to interfere with all this, because y'all, there's <laughs> people who know what they're talking about, and I'm trying to get a little higher level question about what it is you're talking about. Now that I've interrupted you, I'll just ask it. <laughs> so this is that little pop up at, uh, at PSE, and I've been so very focused on what the clean energy is and we look at it from the perspective of there's a number of different types of resources, demand side, supply side, and a part of what we'll have to figure out with the clean energy implementation plan is how that's going to be done, how we'll acquire resources of both types in a way that, you know, that, that, that assists in the equitable distribution of benefits and reduces the burdens to, to vulnerable populations and highly impacted communities. It, to me, my head has always been about that four-year implementation plan is about how we're going to be acquiring resources to achieve to, to and a part of that is how do we achieve these these goals it seems like there's also a piece of what was discussed this is where i'm a little bit lost like would is there a thought that something like our low income assistance program is also supposed to be included in the four-year uh, uh four-year community implementation plan that's what I thought y'all were talking about. And I Ian was like, oh, that's a higher level. And it all made sense, except I'm not sure if that's what So that's kind of really direct question. <coughs> Does anyone want to respond? Ian. I, 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 I think you put a you put a much finer point on what I was trying to say. Like the CEIP is a planning document for how you're going to be acquiring resources, how you're going to be either achieving this from compliance, how you're getting to that 2030, 2035. And is that the right place to have the description of your low income and your equity programs? Yeah. The alternative compliance is under sub two, correct? That's what it's mentioned in 040. The description of alternative compliance, but I think it's in that as well. I'm not but the difference, what I'm, what I'm trying to make sure that I understand yeah. from, from your conversation is, is I can acquire demand side and supply side resources in a way that creates these, some of these benefit streams. Is a different thing than saying, oh, and I have a low income assistance program. I've got the, these other types of things. A low income weatherization program to me would fall in the category of demand side resources, and maybe that fits in there. It's, it's it's things that aren't directly associated with acquiring resources. Do those? Do, 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 are, it sounds to me like y'all are talking about. Some people are saying, yeah, that's supposed to be in the clean energy implementation plan. Some folks are saying, no, it's not. Well, I could be misinterpreting what you're saying. I don't saying. think that's the only conversation because I actually I, I agree with what you're saying and it, it, conflating bill assistance, for example, with equity lens mm -hmm. over resource acquisition is part of the problem here. So I do think we need to a little bit separate those things and understand them as uh, all similar but different kinds of discussions. So um, whether bill assistance goes in the CIP, which should have a question about demand side work, I think is a question to explore. It's not where I was going with it, I think. So. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I kind of agree with that. And in, you know, what you mentioned is that in this planning document, you are basically developing your research procurement plans. And I think that that's where a lot of this equity language comes in is, you know, when you're looking at an equitable distribution, you're looking at different benefits and different resources. I do think that fits squarely within the planning process because those are the things you need to be considering as you're looking for a resource procurement. So I think this question of, of how we separate out, you know, bills is assistance programs and, and things like that is, is a good question. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about right now. Um, but I do think that, again, this, this framework does fit into planning because it is directly related to which resources will hopefully decide to procure. Yes. Wow, you speechless? <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm, I was just contemplating uh, what Kelly was saying, but uh, I do have a kind of a, just a general question just to throw out there. Um, for most of the utilities in this room who are uh, consumer owned, we basically make no profit. So all the money we we spend, we need to recover through rates. And, and the question I have is if you have in a, are in a situation where you have a significant number of your customers are would qualify as needy or low income or whatever the terminology we're going to use. Um, and you're going to do something like was suggested earlier, like, you know, where some of them provide rooftop solar or whatever, we're going to have to recover the cost of that from every other customer. So the question is, how can you provide benefits to every customer? Because that's what it says you're supposed to do in that sort of scenario. Because I just don't see how you could do it. You'd end up having a situation where some low income customers with rates would go up to pay for the rooftop solar of of the customers that you're providing it to. And is that inconsistent? The question is, is that inconsistent with the statute, which it says all customers must benefit? Respond to that briefly. I mean, I don't think we need to get down this one hole necessarily, but creating programs that keep people connected to energy and make it affordable to them is ultimately beneficial because it can reduce expenses associated with disconnect, reconnect, bad debt. And it's, it can be cheaper to give them an affordable rate than it is to go through all of that. <clears throat> and that's a, that's one simple answer. And so there is benefit if you're just looking at it from a purely economic standpoint from pursuing the rate. Well, okay, so several of my util the utilities I work with have rates that were three cent less than three cents a kilowatt hour. Would that be sufficient? It's four cents a kilowatt. I mean what the, Part of the challenge is, is that you're saying, you know, lower the rates and so forth. These customers, what is low enough? If I can, if I can jump in, maybe we have a separate process where we're talking about the equity language and the lower income assistance. We're trying to figure out, you know, what are the definitions around that? What does that mean? How is that going to apply in CETA? And here we're talking about where is that going to live? So maybe we're putting the cart a little bit ahead of the horse. Because maybe we should first figure out what that means in context of CETA, then figure out where it lives in the process. Because I'm not arguing that we shouldn't be doing this work. I think it's important work that absolutely deserves uh, attention and effort. I just want to make sure we're putting it in the right place. Yeah, I agree. The process. I think we're conflating things at this point. But do you think that's true for low income energy assistance? I, I don't think that's true for kind of the, the broader set of language that we're talking about. So, yes, if you're just talking about the section. Well, yes, we should be figuring out where it goes, I guess, partly, and, and I think part of the argument is being it does belong here for that reason, right? So we are having a we should have a conversation about where it goes now if we're having a conversation about what's in CEIP, and there's an argument that the equitable distribution of benefits belongs in in the CEIP. And how, I think how much of that is probably what we're talking about, how far reaching would you bring it, everything from Section 12. Not trying to say that that's necessary. Uh, real quick, Johnny, you had your hand up. Okay, I think <laughs> it is maybe dated, so I'm I'm not even sure I should say it because the conversation has moved on a little bit. Um, the CEIPs are the actual implementation plans for four years and four years of how we're going to get to the goals, and the goals include not just the standards there, there's the benefit that goes, you know, the equity language we've been talking about in section four and in section five. 
And so proposing interim targets of how we're getting to those goals. And the specific targets for energy efficiency, demand response, and renewable energy is not just resource acquisition. It's also, I mean, if you look at energy efficiency, you can see the same, reducing load. If you're looking at DR, reducing peaks, and energy and renewable energy and non emitting is how you're getting to those targets, the standards for 2030 and 2045. I think we tie ourselves in knots a lot by by looking at anything you know when we get when we're looking at these things but it includes um the energy plan is going to inevitably bring in parts of the 10-year plan for the very small utilities and the irp for the slightly larger utilities that are their longer range plans and it's going to have to bring it in to say this is how we're getting to reaching those goals and philip is dying to say something like that. Well, but i just want to and so so in in that though, I guess well, my, my perspective is of course, I consider energy efficiency and demand response and generators, those are all resources. So my question is just, are, are, is this clean energy implementation plan about how we're gonna acquire these various types of resources? And maybe it includes distributed generation, maybe it includes energy storage. How we're gonna go about acquiring them to further these goals? for the, the, the highly impacted and vulnerable populations. Is it is it contained within that? How we're gonna acquire all of these types of resources and how we're gonna do it in a way that benefits these this subgroup? Or is it even beyond that, like the low income assistance programs? That's the piece where I'm still a little bit lost on. Yeah, yeah. So that's the piece that I'm still a little bit lost on. Is it, is it about how we're acquiring the resources to achieve these objectives? Or is it, and how are we going to have low income rate programs as well? I just want to be able to understand it. If somebody thinks that we're supposed to do the other, <coughs> other part, it would be helpful to know for when I go back to the future. So if your acquisition of resources had to include this equity overlay, what would that look like for you? Um, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, right? We're sort of working through those ideas, a lot of ideas of how you might do it. Um, in fact, low income weatherization might fit into that category, right? Where it's a way we're gonna go out and acquire conservation and it's a it's something we do already, right? But it's, it's that sort of idea is that it might shape where we put distributed generation, it might shape, it might influence how we implement those types of programs, all of those kinds of things. Um, and those all fit, though, under this rubric of we will acquire resources to further these goals. It's then a separate thing to say, are, are, is somebody expecting that we'll also be including, you know, rate programs and things of that? Uh, well, uh, oh, sorry. I think my brain turned off for a second or something, but uh, it's back, I hope. And I guess when I'm looking at the CEIP and the elements that are supposed to be in it, I see four main elements that are outlined. And I'm kind of missing the, the where or how there's a link. I understand there will be a link farther down, but I'm not understanding the link with the CEIP to like programming. <laughs> For equitable benefits. I think it's under four. Identify specific actions to be taken by in this case, the consumer owned utility over the next four years, consistent with utilities' long range resource plan and resources adequacy requirements. So you're, it's, it's the long range plan that's the CEAP under the IRP, which is your basically plan. So I think that if you're looking at specific actions, that's where you have to say, are we being equitable? So then are you, so then okay, maybe everyone has already said this already, but I didn't quite get it. So then we're looking at the CEIP as being more of a programmatic listing of how you achieve the targets. Is that your specific plan on how you're going to meet those targets? So what programs you use or? I have not um, read that to me that. Does it say meet the standards, Johnny? And the, the standard is 80-20 by 20-30, right? That's the standard. 
Well, it's the net 100 standard by 23 and 100 percent standard by 2025. Right. So it proposes the interim targets for meeting the standards. Right. And I so agree, it's the steps that you're going to take to get there. Related to energy efficiency, DR, no more those, are the, yeah, those are the specific targets for the EE, the demand response, and renewable energy. The interim targets are more like, are, you know, Doug said earlier, this is going to be lucky. There's no smooth line. You're going to be doing stuff that gets you to 2030. Um, and you you would say, I mean, this is just throwing it out there. I'll be at 40% by 2024 and 60% by 2026. You know, it's kind of that's your interim targets. You know, this, and this is then the CEIP is saying in four year chunks, how do we plan to get to it this far? And the next four year plan is how do we get it the rest of the way to 2030? I think I want to clarify. So, from where my, my previous comments, <laughs> so in terms of uh, the, the equity components, I think there are relevant pieces such as energy efficiency, uh, potential for demand response, uh, distributed generation. I think separate out some of the Inflation that I think occurred. I think the actual bill assistance type programs don't necessarily live in this particular plan. Um, and so there's overlap, but it's not duplication of Section 12 in here. I think they're, they inform each other to a certain extent. And I, I just feel like if at the heart of, of this legislation is this, this equity component. and so that we would not be needing that, I think, that we did not in some way address that. And not that I have to address the entire suite of programs, but those that we are, that are germane to the elements here. Uh, that was a great discussion on that point. I think it would be uh, useful to make the distinction that Phil suggested. Uh, so I, I think. I think we figured out some good stuff here. Uh, and I would like to talk about resource adequacy. Uh, because it seems like there's a, a pretty big divergence of opinion. Actually, I'm not sure that's true. But um, anyway, there certainly are some uh, comment that offers about no, you know, no need for anything in rules. Uh, what a uh, resource adequacy standard might be. And I just want to uh, hear that out a little bit and see whether uh, there is any thoughts of uh, how the rule should say anything about what a uh, sufficient or uh, reasonable <coughs> resource adequacy standard might be. I can start by saying I, I don't know what that standard is, but I do think that um, in the rules it is important that utilities are using a the same or a similar standard. And so um, I will let utilities talk about you know what standards they're using and, and what makes sense. But I, I do think that um, utilities all across Washington are using different standards and that uh, that, that makes a little bit complicated. So consistency is uh, I'm the old curmudgeon here, so there may there may be some wisdom here. There may be some uh, okay boomer aspects to this. Um, first of all, I, I guess I would say that uh, utilities should have at least similar reliability assurance of reliability of service, which is distinguishable from resource adequacy. Um, you know, one utility may be situated differently than another and have a different standard. I, I can see some room for that. Um, but but resource adequacy is a way of getting to reliability of service. Um, and on resource adequacy in particular, uh, there's a question of market reliance. And different utilities are much very dramatically on market uh, and the way I read CETA is it, 
defines resource adequacy as though it were a certain parameter. It has a value. And that's actually not the reality in the world. Resource adequacy has a huge risk element to it. You don't assess resource adequacy as, yes, we'll be uh, resource adequate in all circumstances, because if you did that, you, you wouldn't be able to afford the rates. And on the other hand, you can't say, well, I'm going to rely on market serve all my load uh, because that's cheaper, because then you have huge risks that you're placing your customers and owners under. So it's, that's, a, in my view, that's a problem with the law, and it's going to make it problematic to develop rules for resource adequacy. Uh, the industry generally is struggling with this. There was uh, the Northwest Power Pool had a symposium on this uh, a little over a month ago. Um, and, and I guess the last thing I'd add to this is there should be a requirement for utilities to do risk analysis regarding resources. And that risk analysis should avoid the pitfall of assuming the market will be rational. One of the things that says, well, look 10 years forward and determine what the market's going to be. That's a very, very difficult thing to do. And there's a, a, a fairly wide swath of people who believe, well, the market will be rational and supplies will be available, price signals will elicit construction of new capacity. We're actually, Randy Hardy's not here anymore, but we're actually living through a period now where the market is not rational. Those are, I'm sorry to be the bearer of bad news, but those are all problems with trying to make rules for this. But at the same time, I think it's absolutely essential, essential that there be assurances that utilities are doing good planning and good acquisition to meet their resource adequacy needs to provide reliable service. That's, that's the outline, anyway, I think of a reasonable Do you look at this is Johnny? Do you look at resource adequacy as something different than like NERC reliability? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I have a question. I'm not sure how much this is going to be applying to the COUs, but it it, it makes a question for the IOUs, and that I, I'm wondering to what extent then um, because Commerce is going to be doing its assessment of unspecified resources, which will affect how we view market. And um, so is there a connection here? I mean, if, 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 for example, some utilities are reliant on market and we don't know what that fossil fuel mix in market is, and you're going to go through your process, I, I think that also might change the calculation of how we think of resource adequacy for the calculation of being compliant with CETA. And I just don't, I'm not clear at this point of time how they all tie together. Um, this is Glenn. Okay. And um, I, I mean, I think I, I, I don't really see a connection with the, uh, you know, whether market powers uh, uh, got a fossil component to it or not. I mean, I think the utility might decide. Uh, not to rely on market purchases because doing so create a compliance obligation that wouldn't be considered renewable or not emitting. And so therefore, you know, as a utility planner, I might decide to stay away from it for that reason. That would be a separate reason from staying away from it because uh, you can't be sure that it's going to be there when you need it and when everybody else is also you know, wanting to dip into that same supply. I, I think there are two different questions that one might ask about uh, uh, the value of the market purchases as a resource uh, and they, the answers wouldn't necessarily depend on each other. Doug, were you kind of getting into the issue of the uncertainty about how fast carbon emitting resources are going to be retired and how that affects resource adequacy, or are you talking about something different? 
Well, I, I do think there's a connection and maybe it's just not, not clear yet. And then um, if if you, you are under a separate charge to look at what is going to be the what makes up what's the fossil fuel mix of market resources or unspecified resources. I don't think so. Well, the Department of Ecology will be, uh, okay. you know, specifying an emissions rate. But, yeah. Um, but that, but that would affect an, how un, some... an, un, an unspecified resource is not or non-emitting, and that doesn't depend on whether it's this much carbon in it or that much. It's just unspecified. It can be used to comply with the eighty percent requirement in twenty thirty. It doesn't depend on results of the of ecology uh, analysis used for other purposes um, for emissions reporting. From the phone? All right, just one second. Lisa, go ahead, and then we'll get to the through process and the, and the rule will be from that is a joint. Yes, it is. Commerce mm -hmm. process, and I think Doug, that's where you're getting at. You know, like new centralized markets. What, you know, how is how are we going to deal? With, how is CETA going to treat um, purchases from the EIM? When you're, you know, if you're part of that or the EDAM beyond that, and I think that's an outstanding mm -hmm. question. Uh, and then push someone on the phone if you'd like to speak up. Yeah, thanks. This is Garrison from Snohomish. And, uh, you know, as I read the, the language of the legislation itself, I see that the determination of resource adequacy metrics uh, for the resource plan is something that's determined by the utilities in the law. So if you look at Section 14.1G, you know, I don't really see a, a punt here to an external party. It, and, you know, because utilities are so different, you know, I think that might be a really good thing. Uh, and to echo what was said before, you know, essentially these are really uh, the risk criteria that utilities are using to manage the risk of their customers, and our risks are really different. You know, um, our utility is not a balancing authority, which means that we have a different risk profile and resource adequacy metric than maybe some of our peers in the region. And one of the things that uh, makes this a concern potentially is that if we were to have an overly rigid risk metric that didn't match our particular need, you know, that's a real potential to add costs that may not be necessary for our customers and is something that we're really keeping an eye on with our customers in mind. Anyone want to respond? <clears throat> add on to anything that's been said. So I would add on to what, what Charlie said and what the person on the phone just says. One of the challenges with, with this particular provision is, is that the industry itself in the Pacific Northwest doesn't really have a good idea of how to either measure or regulate resource adequacy. And the, this was pointed out by Charlie, the Northwest Power Pool is trying to figure that out and come up with some approaches. I think, to, in my way of thinking, any rules at this point is, is putting the cart before the horse. We really need to figure let the industry figure it out. And it's not, I'm not going to be part of that. I'm not suggesting I, I would be, but you know, we just don't know how to do this at this point. And we're, we're, we're trying to figure it out. And I think rules are just going to complicate. And actually, I, 